So, uh, as I said, this is uh, Rob McDonald. He's going to be talking about VSP meshing. Uh, we are near as makes no difference to 1230, which seems like a good place to start. So, uh, Rob, you are more than welcome to go ahead and, and take over. Thank you much, Brandon. Welcome, everybody, uh, to, the, to this VSP workshop. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to join us today. This talk is uh, about some of VSP's meshing capabilities. It um, and we'll try and survey a bunch of them. I've I've updated it, but there's there's some more things that maybe I'll try and interject that didn't quite make the slides. Uh, these slides were originally developed in the context of feeding the CFD tool to Cart 3D, and I'm going to leave these slides in that context just because Cart 3D. Uh, can, can take in different, a diversity of inputs that I think make it a uh, relevant for a lot of different tools. So even if you're not using CART 3D, hopefully you'll be able to see your application in uh, and whatever your needs are in these slides. So these are basically then just, you could say paths to unstructured triangulated surface meshes. Um, up on the upper right is sort of the on-screen representation from OpenVSP this quadrilateral wireframe. And here you can see we've seen it in a, in a hidden mode. And so that's where we start from for these representations uh, and for the meshing. We have that on screen. And what we're, what we're gonna talk about today is there's at least three paths to get where we need to go. So the one of the paths that we'll be talking about is taking the smooth Bezier surface, the mathematical representation that underlies this wireframe, and we will take that representation and go through the CFD mesh tool to generate a triangulated unstructured mesh like this one. So that'll be uh, isotropic triangles. So they're all trying as hard as they can to be equilateral triangles. And that's one path through our mesh generator. Uh, we also have a path where we can take that wire that wireframe and we can drop in diagonals on each panel and then run it through a tool called CompGeom in VSP. And that does what's called a CSG, a, um, a computational solid geometry operation to take the, the Boolean union of those components and intersect them together. And what that leaves you with is away from intersections, the triangles are exactly the same, nothing happens. But near these intersections, you're intersecting the triangles themselves. And so you create these sort of sliver triangles and you split triangles near those intersections, but you get this sort of a, a watertight shape. If you're using CART 3D, we can also export a triangle file that has not yet been intersected. And so you can see if you look closely where say this vertical tail meets the fuselage, you'll notice that there's no little sliver triangles and that that intersection line has not been resolved. And then that unintersected triangle file, CART3D has its own tool called Intersect, which is capable of doing CSG operations. And so there's some reasons why if you're a CART3D user, you might prefer to write out an unintersected file and then use CART 3D's intersect tool to perform that intersection operation. Now, this is the exact same slide. I've just zoomed in here a little bit to give a better view in case you didn't understand or it wasn't clear what I was talking about in terms of these different uh, slides and uh, these different modes. You can see here the quadrilaterals are just passing through one another. There's no intersection computed initially. When we go to CFD mesh, we compute that intersection and we try and generate equilateral triangles everywhere we can. Nice high quality equilateral triangles. When we do an unintersected file, all we're doing is we're dropping in the diagonal and we're not computing this intersection at all, but we can write that out. And then you can go through that through CART3D's intersect or through CompGeom built in OpenVSP and generate that intersected file along the edge. And so you end up with these very thin sliver triangles, some needles, some people might call them, but they're different paths to a watertight triangulated geometry. And different analysis tools, basically these two bottom files, different analysis tools out there will use either of these as an input and as a starting point for your work. And one last uh, glamour shot uh, on these. 
So there's some pros and cons to each of these paths. Um, the unintersected path has the advantage that it's really fast, right? VSP is not doing hardly any work. We're just writing out the file. Um, it's a very robust path. It relies on CART 3D's intersection tool, that, and that's a very robust tool. And OpenVSP isn't doing any of the hard work, so that's very robust. And it has the key advantage when you're using CART 3D's design framework that it allows CART 3D to then handle the finite differences of the geometry before the intersection. And it allows it to chain rule through and use that to create derivatives. So that's the really the main, the biggest reason why you would use this unintersected path to CART 3D is if you're also using the adjoint optimization framework in CART 3D, and that would get you give great derivatives. Now, one of the cons is also robustness, and you may wonder how can robustness be a pro and a con? Well, the truth is, is CART 3D's intersect tool, while formally robust, that means that in true degenerate cases, for example, if you truly have two triangles that lay exactly on top of one another, uh, a true degenerate case, CAR 3D's tool doesn't handle that well. It, it doesn't know what to do. And so you end up needing to slightly perturb, you know, maybe a 10 to the minus six perturbation of one geometry inside the other to get past that. So there's situations where CAR 3D's tool uh, doesn't handle some cases gracefully uh, that it could otherwise. And it also adds an extra step to the process. Using the built-in CompGeom tool, it's fast. It's probably, it's not as fast as, as CAR3D's intersect tool, but it's fast. It's robust. Um, it handles some special cases that CAR3D doesn't handle, including things like uh, those perfectly coincident triangles, but also things like a thin actuator disk or other thin surfaces uh, and handling those in a logical way. It also allows us to intersect subsurfaces. And so if you've used subsurfaces to model um, uh, something where you're gonna want a different boundary condition, whether that's a propulsive boundary condition, a control surface, maybe you want to sum loads in a different way, but it'll CompGeom doing that internally will model those subsurfaces, which the uh, CAR 3D intersect tool won't do. And then I've got robustness down here as a con as well. Because honestly, sometimes it does crash, right? Sometimes CompGeom isn't perfect. And so all of these tools, you sometimes have to fiddle with them to get them to work right. The third path is CFD Mesh. And it has the big pro of much higher quality triangles. You avoid all of those needle, those sliver, those very thin triangles. And it also works with things like actuator disks and sort of those thin surfaces that a lot of other tools don't work with. It will also resolve subsurfaces, just like CompGeom will. Um, it now will do, it will do negative volumes, which I should have added to the list. CompGeom will also now do negative volumes. We'll talk about that more uh, later in the pitch. And actuator disks and things like that. So the pro list is similar here. Uh, you can also have more control over the mesh resolution. You can add sources to control mess resolution near certain flow features, and that can be a big benefit. But as usual, it's not perfect either. It sometimes crashes, and so there are some robustness cons there and some tricks to, run, to, to do to get it to run reliably. So exporting an unintersected file is incredibly easy. If you've got a model loaded in VSP, all you have to do is click File, Export, Cart 3D, pick a name, type in your name, and then click accept. One, two, three, four, five, that's it. All you have to do to export an unintersected file. And this works actually not just for Cart 3D, but for any of these triangulated file formats. So if you have a tool that instead uses STL files and you want to output unintersected STL files, um, or some of these others like the Gmesh file, um, any of these unintersected triangle file formats, any of these triangle formats will also write out an unintersected representation if you just have your model loaded and you just go file, export, choose the format, type in the name and click accept. And as soon as you click accept, what's gonna happen is the, the, the screen will update. You'll notice that all of your geometry components will be showed 
will be changed to no show, they'll be hidden, and we will have created a new mesh geom component. And that mesh geom component represents what just got written out. And that'll be shown and selected in the screen. And if you look closely at this mesh geom, you'll see that these components are all passing through one another. This sort of teal wing is passing right through the, the wing body fairing and into the fuselage. There's nothing trimming that wing on the interior. And that's just demonstrating that it's in fact an unintersected file. And this is what the screen looks like immediately after you've done that export. If instead you want to do an intersected export, what you need to do first is run CompGeom. And so here we are back at a screen where we've got our airplane loaded with our model, everything's shown. And what you do is you go to analysis, you click analysis, CompGeom, and then execute. Um, I have oversimplified things that you need to choose which set you're operating on. And this, this year we don't have a dedicated talk where we're going to talk about how sets are used. But sets are, are groups of, of geoms of things from this browser. Each geom can be in one or more sets. And sets are groups of these that you then use in a functional way. You use them for an analysis. So they have a, a purpose. And here we'll talk a little bit more later about what the normal set is and what the degen set is here. But in this case, we're using the normal set, which is all the shown components and none in the degen category. So you'll want to check your sets before you hit execute. But if the shown set, which is the default, if that's good enough for you to run CompGeom, all you have to do is one, two, three, analysis, CompGeom, execute. And as soon as you do that, the screen will look like this as soon as it finishes running. Once again, your normal components will be no-showed and the mesh geom that was created will be created and will be highlighted. And you'll notice in the screen, there's now this mesh. And if you look closely, you'll see that now every component is trimmed against one another. The, the teal wing no longer goes through the fairing and into the fuselage. It's now trimmed at that intersection and you can see some evidence of these sliver, these needle triangles along that intersection. So you can see where that all happened, and this is now an intersected file. It also created this output, which shows the wetted areas and the trimmed volume of each of these components. And so, for example, this first line tells us that the fuselage, its wetted area before the intersection was 3,524 square units. But once we've trimmed out, you know, these intersections with the, the horizontal and vertical tail, and we've trimmed out the intersection with this fairing and everything else, it's down to just 3,141 square units. So it's doing that wetted area calculation and showing all that for all of these components. We don't need that information right now. And so the next step for us to do is to just close this window. So we'll click the only thing you have to do after hitting execute is close that window, we'll click there. And then you can see if we then wanna export that intersected file, it's just like our first one for exporting the unintersected version where we do one, two, three, four, five, which is just file, export, choose the file format, type in the name and click accept. And that one, two, three, four, five will recognize that we already have a mesh geom here and it will search through and it will write out that mesh geom. And so since it's been intersected, we'll get that written out. And that's right now, that's the two ways to handle the first two types, unintersected tri-files and intersected tri-files through CompGeom. Just that easy. Um, now I mentioned <clears throat> that we had the option to choose uh, different sets. And in this case, this is one of the new features that we're that we're still developing that I'm working with Dave towards. Where here you can choose some components to be a normal set, which is what we did before. You can also choose some components to be a degen set. And so what we've done here is I've set up two sets, one which I've called my non-lifting surfaces. So that's going to be this pod or any body or any of the fuselage. And then I have another set which I'm calling my lifting surfaces. In this case, it's the wing. And what I've done is I've chosen to do my non-lifting surfaces as a normal set, as thick, fat bodies, 
but my lifting surfaces as a degen set. And you'll notice if you look carefully, this is a cambered wing and you'll notice that we don't have any thickness here. This is a thin vortex lattice like potato chip type representation. And we've then run comp geom on it. And what you see is we've actually trimmed this thin surface so that it does not pierce and does not go through the, the fat surface, the thick surface. And so we have a mixed model where part of it is a thin representation and part of it is a thick representation. And this is one of the things that we're working on to make so that we're headed towards VSP Aero being able to support this kind of information. Um, but what we'll see is that this mixed normal and degen will start to show up in a number of contexts. And wherever it shows up, this is what's going on, is you have the ability in that context to mix thick and thin surfaces together, and you can choose one set for each. So we've got a little opportunity here for a bit of a practice session, um, and I will just quickly go through and do a little bit of a demo. And to do that demo, I will start and we'll just load VSP. And, you know, we'll do what I jokingly call everybody's favorite airplane, which is simply, you know, a pod and a wing together. And if you look closely, what you can see in here is that the wing goes right through the pod, right? There's no intersection computed at all. It's just that wing and pod together. And so if we want to do that export, it's just like I said, one, two, three, four, five. We'll click File, Export. We choose our file format, Cart 3D. And here I'm going to browse and go to the desktop so you'll see it pop up, although maybe on a different desktop. And this will be unintersected as a try file. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's just turn it off. Um, and so we've got the ability to write out this unintersected file. It's on the desktop, I'll say accept. And just like we said would happen, um, we've, our geometry has been no-showed. Um, a mesh geom has been created and it's selected. We can look here and we see that while diagonals were dropped in and we see Triangles here, there was no intersection done. The wing still passes through the fuselage. If I look at this in hidden mode, we, we now the triangles are opaque and we see that there's no intersection performed. Uh, my desktop, those files were written right here and you can see it actually wrote out both the tri file and this other file that goes with it called a TKEY file. And so that's our unintersected file that was written. I'm going to delete that mesh geom very quickly. Let me go ahead and show our geometry again. And this time what I'll do is I will run comp geom. So like I said, you go to analysis, you go to comp geom, it opens up. We can choose our normal set and our degen set. We're going to do shown and none, just like uh, in the demo. We'll click execute and it performs that intersection and immediately You'll see that those two components were no-showed. Mesh geom was selected, created, and selected. And you can see here that the wing normal no longer passes through the fuselage. It's been trimmed. And you can see these thin triangles created showing that intersection. And again, if you change to a hidden view, they're very evident. You can see what's going on there. Likewise, in this window, you'll see our wetted areas, our trimmed wetted areas of these components have been calculated and output. Um, if we then, we'll close that and we'll come back and just as before, we'll export one, two, three, four, five, file, export, choose our format, cart 3D try. And this time we'll change the name to intersected, try file, we'll accept that. And it just happened in the background. There's those two files and we have both of them there. And working with intersected and unintersected exports is just that easy. Let me go back and pick up on the, oh, a couple of other things. 
the resolution that you see here on screen, let's just show that real quick. Let me show all the components. The resolution of that tri file is the resolution of the wireframe you see on screen. And so all the different components in VSP have some sort of a control for tessellation. And so if that resolution is inadequate and you, for whatever reason, you know that you need to come in and you need to resolve your model to be more finely adapted, you can come in here and all you have to do is if you improve that resolution here in the wireframe, for example, when you run CompGeom and you execute, it takes a little longer, but you can see that resolution is reflected in the CompGeom and those sliver triangles, again, are limited just to that intersection region. So you do have resolution control uh, uh, when you're doing these kinds of outputs. All right, let's go back, we go. Um, so the next thing that we can talk about is going to our high quality measure and I'm looks like I'm talking too slowly so I'm gonna have to pick it up a little bit but the CFD mesh generator and this is used to create these high quality isotropic triangles and it is a surface mesh generator we we don't do any volume grid generation if you're using a CFD code that needs a volume grid you're gonna have to go to another tool to generate that but hopefully we can make generating the surface mesh quicker and easier for you. We work on the smooth Bezier surfaces and we calculate the Bezier intersection curves. So this is done by VSP. It works with subsurfaces, negative volumes, actuator disk. It has built-in curvature control. You can also have sourcing control for manual control of the resolution. It also will model wakes if you want, half models or the outer domain. So lots of features here. And many CFD tools are going to work better with a high quality mesh than with the thin slivers in the um, the thin slivers in the 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 comp geom type mesh. So the curvature based meshing it is based on the local radius of curvature. If you look at a piece of a surface um, that is curved in both directions, so a a surface that has compound curvature, there's a geometric concept called the greatest principal normal curvature. And so what this does is if you imagine these two cutting planes that are cutting the surface, creating these two, uh, these two curves, you can rotate those two cutting planes, they're orthogonal, but if you rotate them, you can find basically an orientation where one of the curves has the maximum curvature and the other has the minimum curvature. And so the greatest principal normal curvature is when you've rotated these planes to find the maximum local curvature. And we're gonna use that as our measure of curvature for our curvature-based meshing. And curvature is K, is this quantity that is the reciprocal of the radius of an equivalent circle. So you can imagine a curve like this, who's radius is constantly varying it's a tighter and tighter curve instantaneously at some point it acts like a circle and so we can talk about that local radius of curvature obviously down here the radius of curvature is much smaller and up here it is much larger it's a flatter curve but we'll talk about curvature as a measure by either radius or the reciprocal as the curvature itself we have two curvature based meshing criteria in CFD mesh. One is based on the maximum gap. And so that is the, if you draw a line segment as one of the edges of a triangle, what is the gap between the center point of that edge and the true curved surface? And we compare that, uh, often you'll wanna compare that to the local length. But we'll have a constraint on that maximum gap as a dimensional constraint. So for example, if your model is built in inches and you put in 0 0.001, that means that the maximum gap would be a thousandth of an inch between the triangles and your surface. And so that's a very straightforward dimensional way of working with, uh, with the constraint. And here's the equation for it. I'm not gonna go through that right now. The other way of working with curvature meshing criteria is this property that we call number of circle segments. And what that is, is 
if any given radius were a complete circle, any local point were equivalent to a complete circle, how many segments would we divide that circle into at this resolution? This illustrated case is a num circle segments of eight. And so an equivalent circle would be divided into eight segments. The difference between these is the one on the left, the max gap, works very much in a dimensional case. It, you're giving it input in the dimensions of the model. And so you, you specify that. And it, if you have very, very small features, you may not resolve them because the features are tiny, but that gap, that tolerance stays the same. On the other hand, num circle segments, you're specifying it in a non-dimensional sense. And so no matter how small the feature is on your model, if you set this to eight or 16 or 32, uh, no matter how tiny that feature is, if you have a circle of it, there's going to be 32 segments around it. And so, you know, one works in sort of a non-dimensional way, one works in a much more dimensional way. And you'll, you'll, there may be times when you want one or the other. I'd recommend you choose one and stick with it. Using both at the same time is pretty confusing. Um, there's a parameter in the called the growth ratio limiter, and this is a ratio, the growth ratio, which represents what is the length of the next edge as a proportion of the current edge. And so a ratio of one would mean there's no growth, right? Uniform spacing. A ratio of 1.2 means the second edge can be 1.2 times the prior edge. And so each one geometrically grows at a ratio of 1.2. And you can see then all the way up to something like a growth ratio of two, every edge is doubling in length, and that's a very fast growth. Typically, we're going to constrain. We use this as a constraint to say the edges cannot grow faster than this. And typically, you're going to want to constrain it to something like 1.2, 1.3, 1.1. You want pretty gentle growth on most meshes, but that's how the growth ratio limiter works. There's a feature in there called the rigorous 3D growth limiting. You, you don't want to turn this on in almost all cases. The, the rigorous growth limiting, um, what it's used for is there's situations where you might have a surface like this puck with a very, very flat surface, very little local curvature, oops, um, but is then nearby in 3D space, something with lots of curvature like this little sphere. And you can't totally see it here, but the sphere is very close to this puck. And if you run without rigorous 3D growth limiting, there's no way for the puck to know that the sphere is here. And so the puck will generate very large triangles on that flat surface. And that runs really fast. But if you're then going to try and grow a volume mesh that spans the gap between them, you're going to be unsuccessful because one side of the volume mesh will have tiny triangles and the other side of the volume mesh will have these large triangles. If these two are physically touching, if they're not just nearby, but if they're physically touching, they intersect each other, then the small triangles will communicate through that intersection to the other side, and you don't need rigorous growth limiting. However, if you have this case where there's a gap with high curvature next to flat surfaces, then you can turn on rigorous 3D growth limiting. And what that'll do is that'll do a spatial search to handle that growth and thereby we will be able to communicate these small triangles from the sphere over to the puck and generate small triangles on the puck. Like I said, this is, this is a pretty slow feature. It will slow down your meshing. You, 99% of the time, people don't need it. Uh, but I see a lot of people on the Google group who are frustrated with meshing and they turn it on because they're just clicking anything. And so um, turn it off, you know, run faster. You probably don't need it. Um, I'm running out of time here, but you can also create sourcing to, to use knowledge of the flow field to add additional mesh resolution. So you can place line, point, and box sources on your geometry. When we have all these different criteria, they are combined in a way that this, this diagram explains how we make the decision of what size to use. Uh, left to right across this chart, we're going to use whatever the smallest indicator is. So if you're using both max gap, num circle segments, and sources at a, in, a, in a region, 
whatever the smallest input is, that's going to be decide what size triangle there will be, what size edge. And then we use constraints vertically. So if that target triangle size is then smaller than the minimum triangle size, then we'll, we'll cut that off with a constraint. And then if it's too big, either because the growth ratio says it has to be smaller or because we're exceeding the maximum edge length, we'll apply these constraints vertically. So at every point in 3D space on the surface, we're going to figure out the target mesh length based on all of these different factors, all of these constraints. Sometimes when you're debugging a mesh, it's useful to turn off one, one value so that you can simplify what's going on. And so this is how you turn off each one. You can take something that, um, that you know, if you want to ignore the maximum edge length, set it to a huge value, set it to 100, set it to 1,000, and then it won't matter. Likewise, the growth ratio, if you set it to 10, it'll never matter. It won't have any impact. Um, and so here's how you can turn off any of these things to help debug what's going on. I have this strategy. Here's where I recommend you really go. Um, and basically start with just using the, the, the max based on the model dimension. So if, you're, if your dimension, if your wingspan is 10, maybe you set max to 0.1, maybe you set it to, to 0.05. You set an approximate value based on just the scale of your model. Uh, set the min equal to that, don't use any sources, and adjust this until you're, you're, you have a good start. Then set the min to something smaller, allow curvature to come in, perhaps set it to 1 20th of the max value. Then choose either the max gap or the num circle segments as your preferred curvature parameter, and then use the other one, turn it off, and adjust that one curvature parameter until you're satisfied, and adjusting the min to make sure that you don't get triangles that are way too small. Then if you need to, you probably won't, adjust the other curvature parameter. So if you use max gap, then maybe you tweak things with num circle segments to get any different effect if you need, or vice versa. And then finally, if you know something about the flow features, shocks or separation or something like that, then use sources to resolve whatever's missing. I'll make this my last slide. Um, and I apologize for not getting through more of this. The, uh, this there's this top model in the OpenVSP hangar. It's actually there to be practice for meshing. It has, you know, this area of constant curvature up top, as well as this extreme curvature that vanishes down to a point. And it's a really good case to play with and experiment in your meshing stuff. And um, I guess I'm gonna extend just a tiny bit. All these slides describe the GUI and how to use them. The one thing that I want to add is we can talk a little bit about negative components. Any geometry, you can now go to the general tab and you can choose it as a negative component. And that now works both with CompGeom and CFD mesh. So in this case, I have three pods and I've chosen that this pod on the top is negative and these two are positive. And then when I run it through CFD mesh, you'll see that it gets carved out and the same thing happens in CompGeom. So we take the union of these and we carve it out and you can see the resulting meshes over here on the right. So negative geometries now work in CompGeom and CFD mesh. And you can use these, for example, to do propulsion modeling, where maybe you have a boundary layer ingestion concept where you're sucking in and then you have an engine outlet. And so in this case, the yellow trumpet is a negative geometry that then is cut out of this. Uh, we also support actuator disks in these. So these are thin surfaces where if your code can, can handle a thin surface in it, you can model that actuator disk in both CompGeom now and CFD mesh and deal with that. And you can do things like put that actuator disk in a duct and it'll be trimmed so you can have that thin boundary condition in a duct. And uh, thank you guys for your time here.